Thank you so much, Fatima. Thank you, Tatiana, Saima. I also want to make sure I thank our amazing team at Data for Black Lives um, and all of you for coming out this evening, um, even with some of the location changes and everything, which I'll talk about. Um, more, now more than ever, we need to be talking about what it means to reclaim data as protest, data as accountability, and data as collective action. And as Basina said, my name is Yeshiva Beth Milner. I am the founder and CEO of Data for Black Lives. Thank you. <laughs> I founded Data for Black Lives in 2017 because for far too long data had been weaponized against black communities. I knew that as technology such as spatial recognition, credit scoring models, and other forms of predictive analytics were becoming more and more popular, and the outputs of these black box algorithms having increasing power over, the, over people's lives, there needed to exist a formidable presence, an independent institution that could expose and dismantle the structures that concentrate the power of data into the hands of a few. Those who choose to wield it as a form of political and social control. We needed an organization like Data for Black Lives that would put the power of data into the hands of those who need it the most, for whom data is protest, data is accountability, and data is collective action. Six years into founding Data for Black Lives, our very existence, and the work that we've done to reclaim data as a tool for social change, has shifted the global conversation on data, changed the cast of characters of who is at the forefront of emerging technologies, and all the while utilizing the datafication of society as an opportunity to make bold demands for racial justice. Originally, this event was meant to be held at the Barnard College Milstein Library, and we believe that institutions come and go, but relationships are what matter, so we are thankful to be still be joined by the amazing faculty and staff at Barnard, and to also welcome Barnard students. We understand the power of our collective voice, especially right now in the current struggle for human, right, for human rights. And we are very aware of what's happening right now with the ongoing student boycotts, the push to reinstate key student groups, and, this, and the push to end the censorship of student and faculty alike. We are unequivocal in our stance from a permanent ceasefire to Gaza and an end to occupation as a whole. And we believe wholeheartedly that university campuses have a responsibility to uphold free speech as a constitutional right, as well as the civil and human rights of their students and the entire community. We would love to revisit having an event on campus after uh, student rights are upheld and the university joins the global call to the Manda ceasefire. Until then, it is incredible to be able to do this speech at post this event at here at the Maltham and Betty Shabazz Center for Education Memorial Center for Education and Memorial Center. While none of us could have imagined being alive in such a time, I really, I don't think I could have ever dreamed of a better place to speak on the theme of data activism. 59 years ago this week, this Tuesday, I think, actually, 21st, February 21st, 1964, Malcolm X was assassinated in this very building when it was still known as the Audubon Ballroom. El Haj Malik. El Shabazz was a black nationalist freedom fighter, and he was a Muslim minister. He pushed the conversation at a critical time in civil rights, away from just reform and assimilation for black people, to building real political power, economic power, and self-determination. Malcolm was assassinated because he courageously and uncompromisingly stood with the oppressed. If Malcolm was alive today, or Dr. Betty Shabazz, 
what would they say about the state of the world? So in September 1964, I'm going to do them in the end, sorry. <laughs> in September 1964, just a few months before his assassination, Malcolm X was one of the first, if not only, black leaders to visit Gaza. He was called anti-Semitic for speaking out for what he saw a growing issue. The use of Zionism, an idea that was built in self-determination, being weaponized as colonialism against entire communities. You can read more about his thoughts in the essay, The Zionist Logic. Malcolm also critiqued the civil rights movement of the time. In his legendary speech, The Ballot or the Bullet, he speaks on the current nonviolent strategies at the time. And I'm paraphrasing. He says, it's not so good to refer to what you're doing as a sit-in. Right there, that brings you down. What goes with it? Think of the image of someone sitting. An old woman can sit. An old man can sit. A chunk can sit. A power can sit. Anything can sit. Well, you and I, we've been sitting long enough. And it's time for us today to start standing and fighting back. The bullets, police dogs, and fire hoses of the past have become the predictive policing, data-driven voter suppression, and facial recognition of the present. Algorithms and other big data technologies, including artificial intelligence, are the engines facilitating the evolution of chattel slavery into the prison industrial complex and that has created the conditions of social and economic inertia that so many of our communities are facing right now. What would the world look like if we took out those call to action to not just push for incremental temporary reform, but to really push for radical change? Perhaps the data would look different. Since 1964, the year of Malcolm X's assassination, the data shows that there's been no progress in, in reducing the income and wealth inequalities between Black and white Americans. That's been persistent for the last 70 years. I'll talk a little bit more later about getting into the nitty-gritty, but think about that statistic. The Oxford language definition of activism is the policy or action of using vigorous campaigning to bring about political or social change. Be but because of Malcolm X, many of us know activism to mean achieving justice, fighting for change, living for change, by any means necessary. When our oppression takes new form, so must our tools. And our tools are defined by our goal. What is our goal? When we talk about data activism, what is our North Star? If there's any takeaway from today's keynote, it's that the point, the goal of reclaiming data as a tool is to build political power, to have a say over decisions that impact our lives. Today, I'll be going into my own story, how I got into this work, how I learned to use data to build the political power of my communities. I'll talk about the work of Data for Black Lives, giving concrete examples from our campaign work. <laughs> and I'll give real, real advice to you all, and we can talk more after too, about becoming not just data activists, but visionary organizers and movement scientists, which is a term we've coined. But first, I want to share some photos. So this is known as a Staffordshire teapot. It was made in approximately early 19th century of fine porcelain. Teapots like these were primarily used by middle and upper class families and in the social and communal lives of women. Around the teapot were where political conversations were had, plans for the future. This teapot and many other artifacts like it were excavated by a team from Columbia University in Barnard in 2011. It was excavated from a site 
that is now known as where Seneca Village, the first property, predominantly black property owning community existed before it was leveled and raised in order to build Central Park. If I'm for African Americans, this I'm quoting New York's is Teresa. <laughs> Seneca Village offered the opportunity to live in an autonomous community far from the densely populated downtown. Despite New York State's abolition of slavery in 1827, discrimination was still prevalent throughout New York City and severely limited the lives of African Americans. Seneca Village's remote location, much north of downtown, likely provided a refuge from this climate. Compared to other African Americans living in New York, residents of Seneca Village seemed to have been more stable and prosperous. By 1855, approximately half of them owned their own homes. With property ownership came something else. Really, the right to vote, which was not afforded to most other people, especially not African American men at that time. In 1821, New York State required African American men to own at least $250 of property and hold residency for at least three years to be able to vote. Of the 100 black New Yorkers eligible to vote in 1845, 10, 10% lived in Seneca, Seneca Village. In order to destroy this community, there needed to be propaganda. There needed to be narratives. This is an excerpt from an article around the same time as the plan was introduced to tonally level and erase Seneca Village and its history. And it didn't see not only was there a necessity to paint people's dwellings and homes in a very prosperous community by any standard in a autonomous community as um, illegitimate, but also as a society tech. You all can read, but in that west of the reservoir, within the limits of Central Park, lies a neat little cell in it. Know this, the thick word and village. I don't even mind it, but it also wants to talk about how they're going to go about it and the debris this this community. And there's so many other articles like this in the historical record. You can go to the next slide. This is a map that shows, this is a map called the State Condemnation Map. This is a map, this map was submitted by uh, someone from the city to identify which plots of land and whose homes would be erased in order to build Central Park. The arrow indicates that all of uh, one of the first individual, the first family who actually uh, purchased land in kind of the village after a white family, the white heads, it sold off the land um, in the early 1820. This area was not considered desirable land. It was rocky, it was largey, but folks were able to do so much and literally turn it into a thriving community. As you can see, there's marked out lots that, that show Chanopee Town, but there's also one that show two-story might Hall law. These are things that people did not have at that time. In Seneca Village, a forgotten community which was a report um, based on the 2011 excavations, researchers noted something very important. We believe that Black New Yorkers established Seneca Village as an autonomous Black community because they felt equality and assimilation within American culture were not realistic goals in the antebellum, in the racially charged antebellum climate. They believe that, researchers believe that for Black residents, Seneca Village not only provided a respite from discrimination, but also embodied us a series of ideas about African pride and racial consciousness. The creation of lasting Black institutions and the attainment of political power. Beyond the economic power this community built, Beyond the fact that they own land, we 
we know even more reasons why they were targeted for erasure. This is a slate pencil that was also found in the Famica village site. It's a symbol of the commitment of the community to education. Records show that most children who lived in Seneca Village attended school. Again, very different from the life in the tenements in the Lower East Side, which we do know about. When we look at Seneca Village, when we look at the thriving coastal communities built by the, the Lenape people, the original people of this land, when we look at here in Harlem, in Chicago, in Milwaukee, in Miami, when we look at what's happening in Gaza, we are reminded of what our goal is. Again, not for temporary reforms, but for long-term social change. To build institutions that will last and be as old as Columbia University, and then are allowed to last that long. And to not have our livelihood and our what, what we built to be remembered as a shanty town. What is political power? Political power, again, is one's ability to influence the decisions that impact their lives. Political power goes beyond voting. Because, as we've seen, one can have the right to vote and no political power. Political power cannot be confused with media presence, or virality, or likes, or shares, and other vanity metrics, as we call it. Because as we witness time and time again, every TV screen in the world can run footage of a murder or genocide with impunity. And there's still no justice or accountability. I learned very, very early this reality. Fairly early on as a, as a high school student, my very first time ever collecting, analyzing, and using data was in response to an incident of police brutality. I learned that alone we could be ignored, but that there was power in a number. When students in a neighboring high school in my hometown, Miami, Florida, organized a peaceful protest, after administrator put a ninth grader in a headlock, it made national news, but not in the way that it would today. I will never forget seeing footage of SWAT team units flooding the school, of police shoving the small frames of students I grew up with against police cars. At CNN and local news, the headlines ran, riot at Miami Edison Senior High. I knew that unless we found ways to be heard, to disrupt the narratives that facilitated this level of abuse, my future and the future of so many other young people would be at stake. Can you go to the next slide? Thank you, Chelsea. We were turned away from public hearings. We were kicked out of school meet board meetings, all because we were demanding accountability around the discipline policies in our school. After being ignored, we hit the ground running. We surveyed over 600 young people about their experiences with arrests and suspensions in schools, and we shared the findings in a comic book. For so many of the young people that we surveyed, this was their first time even ever being asked about their experiences in school. And at that moment, they realized they weren't mad kids because they'd been suspended for forgetting their student ID at home or because they wore the wrong colored T-shirt under their uniform, but that this was a statewide problem and a national problem. And it was known as the school to prison pipeline. <laughs> so four years later, I returned to Miami uh, from graduating college with an arsenal of skills in data collection and research. And part of that, I, you know, I have to thank Brown University's open curriculum because it, being at an institution like that, it really made it possible to take a litany of different research classes. You you weren't being penalized for studying Africana studies and econ at the same time like I did. And um, my North Star again was going back to Miami and supporting the work that was happening there. The minute I got back, I was asked to lead a reproductive justice campaign to address the black infant mortality crisis that was happening. The national infant mortality rate had been steadily decreasing over the past 50 years but the 
gap between the lift the expected livelihoods of black babies and white babies had remained the same. Black babies were three times more likely to die before their first like Did they come on? I know I did that. Did you look around and put my downstairs in the very in the paper? Oh, maybe someone said, thank you, Laddie Bo. Uh, so they didn't register. Um, mothers in the community knew that this tragedy was connected to hospital policies, such as the overuse of cesarean section, the lack of uh, poaching around breastfeeding, and the aggressive marketing of baby formula. And recently, I had a friend who wrote an article highlighting the overuse of cesarean sections. And it was so interesting to see this article being written, but we've been talking about this for years. And this report that I'm going to talk about that, that we cut the surveys for, 89% of the people who'd given birth had been given a cesarean infection. So, but once again, without data, community outcry was ignored. With a small team of moms, I surveyed 300 mothers on their experiences in Jackson Hospital in Jackson Hospital. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, and while we weren't able to bring 300 mothers into the border with us, the hospital CEO could not deny the data that we collected. And a campaign that literally took years to win was able to be achieved in only a few months. But that should not have been the case. But it was realizing that the hospital's reputation was their bread and butter more than actually doing the right thing. Data became a vehicle for political power. Our political power was not money. We were way outspent. It was not media presence. It was not salt status or titles or connections in the hospital system or mighty political circles. We had none of that. Our political power was the sum of our experiences and the strength of them, powerfully and undeniably reflected in the data we collected. Yeah, the campaign was successful. It resulted in concrete policy change. We got the hospital to do the right thing and adopt this policy. But the real impact was a beyond the policy change. This campaign built up the agencies and the capacity of directly impacted people to take on a system and change it for the better of everybody. We also proved that Black communities are already impo impoverished, segregated, and defunded because of the litany of reasons that are to blame, mythology, culture, but by design. We were facing a public, and econ a public health and economic crisis created by government and state policies that designated which communities would win and which would lose, which communities would die and which would lose. Um, well, that's okay. We don't need slides. <laughs> Some of the slides coming up are really, really good, but, um, we'll move the cap into the computer button. Okay. <laughs> so that's fun. So the next slide that I was going to show was to talk a bit about what were the narratives and what were the things that we were facing. And what, what I always like to do when I, do these speeches is talk about studies like the crack baby mare because this was a study led by a researcher in the early 80s 90s and it was a study based on 23 participants right and that the whole point of the study was to prove that um, the biggest threat that we were facing to society was this income and generation of individuals who were born addicted to crack and that that was we needed to subsequently create public policy to stop that. Again, this study was based on 23 participants. This is a screenshot from the New York Times article where they debunked the whole thing and decided to say, and, and the researcher decided to say, actually, that was all fluff. There was a political agenda behind it. And more research came out that showed that the biggest predictor of child's outcomes was not act, it was poverty. One of the young women from the study who was born as a crack baby, she was the first in her family to go to college to break generational curses. So once again, though, while 
years later, they're debunking this myth. It was already set into motion. Another one that I like talking about is a welfare queen. There's tons of studies that back this up, but when we were talking about the experiences that we were facing and the narratives that we face daily, we have to understand how they're driven by research and data. There's one thing I want people to know it's bad. And while there isn't one particular study that really um, that we get point to to say upheld this myth, it was extremely powerful, extremely pervasive in deciding how we treat and how we think about poor people, how we think about single mothers, black mothers, and what, when the reality, the biggest welfare recipients are actually corporations who receive a ton of government subsidies. I'd like to talk about this because it's really, really important that we do not take, just like technology, we do not take anything for granted. And we also need to know what we're really fighting against, its narratives. And, and that unless we understand history, we're, we're doomed to repeat the past. I'm going to talk more into algorithm and the theta, but in first, what I want to do is talk about the history of it. When I started Data for Black Lives, I didn't, I, I never expected just how much history would be involved in addition to predicting the problems of the future. So again, before we talk about algorithm, machine learning, and the ways in which these myths are being reinforced, reinforced and perpetuated in this current moment, we must first discuss the history of big data. We have to tell these origin stories. What were the economic, imperialistic, and colonial contexts that required the level of record keeping, accounting, and surveillance that has come, that have come to define the big data practices of today? Next slide. Contrary to popular belief, slavery was not the antithesis to business innovation. And much of what we know about scientific management, management science, and finance does not come from the factory floor, the railroad, or the steam engine. These big, the big data systems where we're familiar with today, to you, used to control, surveil, and enact violence to maintain power structures and ensure profit on a global scale originated during slavery. In the 1600s and 1700s, the Dutch East and West India companies were the largest commercial enterprises in the world. Hundreds of ships, thousands of em employees, countless offices in Asia and the Americas. Their operations and their value totals more than Apple, Google, and Meta combined. These companies pioneered colonialism. They created the blueprint for globalization. And in the process, we have these data structures today. Next slide. In Dr. Caitlin Rogenthal's book, Accounting for Slavery, Masters of Management, she writes that planters' control over enslaved people made it easier for them to fit their slaves, enslaved African people, into neat empirical roles and columns. This is an example of an abstract. And as you can see, the, uh, the abstraction of the catastrophic loss of human life and the necessary torture to, ma to maintain plantations was needed to serve the owners who were removed from the daily abuse of the literal rows and fields of a cotton, sugar, and tobacco plantations they own. Data moves up and down hierarchies, akin to the way CEOs and boards are, are today responsible for, but never accountable to the violence they inflict. Big data was necessary to distance themselves from the violence and gore capitalism of slavery. Then cut. One of the examples I always show too is a uh, chart. Would you really, what that tells you, will you really? Look at these, say, look, very similar to the actual Excel sheets in the world that we have. I don't even want, like, that, that's a part of the data, but like, what I want people to understand is what we under, what we know of as the organization of information, what we even know about banking and finance, all of that was developed through the primordial economic system of this country. Next slide. Big data is not new. It's not as novel or revolutionary as we worship it to be. It's a part of a long his and pervasive historical legacy and technological timeline of oppression, aggressive public policy, 
And again, the most influential political and economic system that has and continued to shape this country and the world economy. These are all examples of how big data was born out of bond. So what is an algorithm? By definition, an algorithm is a set of step-by-step -step instructions to solve a problem. A recipe is an algorithm. A list of instructions to make the dish, the ingredients that make up the dish, and most importantly, a result based on what we define as success from the very beginning. Whether we want to focus on making something that's really healthy or something that tastes good, regardless of health benefits, these decisions are determined by a question. What are we optimizing? But computational algorithms are a lot more complex, layered. Their ingredients are not just raw data that is fed into them, and the result is not as simple as the outputs that come from them. Scores, ratios, GPS routes, and network recommendation. But as this chart demonstrates, history and values are what influence inputs and outputs. And more importantly, they influence the very models that are trained and developed, the algorithms themselves. Next slide. I'm going to get into our specific campaign around this, but my one of the other examples that I really think drives home the point that connects the past and the future along this thread of big data and algorithms is the example of FICO credit scores. Most people don't know that the Fair and Isaac Corporation is the Fair and Isaac Corporation. It's a company, a private company uh, founded by a mathematician and an engineer in 1980. Uh, FICO scores was launched in 1990. And for the last 30 plus years, they've been innovating around machine learning. Um, even when I go do these presentations in the government, there's people in the government who don't know that FICO is not a government agency. That is how deeply intertwined and how powerful these companies who um, own our data and who score us quite nearly are. We're told that the inputs to the FICO algorithm are the amount of debt we have, the, the percentage of missed payments, um, our, uh, all these other factors. This information, our data, that's provided through a collusion of data brokers, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, are taken and fed into the FICO algorithm. And while, again, we're told that certain behaviors and characteristics comprise our credit score, we're never able to fully verify because FICO is proprietary. It is owned by a private company. It's a black box, devoid of transparency, with the purpose of displacing accountability away from the full profit companies that make profit from our data and us. FICO scores reflect the ways in which algorithms hold for tremendous power over our lives. At this very moment, there are students who won't be able to continue the next semester because they don't qualify for a subsidized loan. There are families who are homeless right now because of the three-digit score. There are people who do not have transportation to and from work if they have to drive or because of subprime auto insurance. FICO schools are extremely powerful. They are responsible for 90% of the lending decisions in this country, and 232 million people, I think, which is the majority of the U.S., can be scored by a FICO algorithm. Again, while it's in federal violation of federal law to deny people housing, employment, and education based on race, you can't sue an algorithm. And, it, and private companies like FIGO who I also must mention is in their best interest to make sure people who have low scores and others who don't argue that their, their algorithms don't discriminate. They say nowhere in the algorithm is, is the input race a variable. But we know the history of this country. We know that you don't even need to put race in a variable in order for it to predict race. That side. Part of that is because of the role the zip codes it played. And how zip codes, because of the legacy of slavery, once again, and because of the, the legacy of re Reconstruction, Jim Crow, and redlining policies of the 1930s, but also the redlining that we saw as early as Seneca Village, we know who lives in what zip code. So, In 1933, as part of the New Deal, the Homeowners' One Corporation developed a greeting system that deemed some areas desirable, 
while others hazardous. It did not, once again, matter that federal law ruled that racial zoning was unconstitutional. The creation of security maps and the red line of black communities encouraged the practices of real estate for neighborhood association and white mob violence made it, that made it possible for black people, impossible for black people to own homes. According to the amazing historian NDV Colony, neighborhood grading during the 1930s was hardly a science, but program scientific, but, but the program scientific trappings helped turn popular racial knowledge into real world consequences. Today, 74% of the places created as hazardous in 1933 remain low-income, under-resourced, and neglected. Next slide. This is actually on the um, latitude. It is the Hollis Lord Corporation map of uh, this area, Hollow. And we uh, probably think you're going to get showing these randomly, but I'm going to send out these slides and you guys can actually play around with them with the data. Uh, but um, one thing that, that the researchers who filmed the school map did was that they uh, used uh, social affordability index, which is, again, I don't like totally condone or endorse any particular metric, but this is the Center for Disease Controls SVI index, which is used to assess a community's capacity to prepare for, respond to, and recover from human and natural disasters. Um, it's based on a score from zero to one, and it combines a number of factors, social and economic, housing and transportation, household composition, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at this, the areas that were designated as hiring is actually you take to have very high vulnerability in them. So literally, the places that were demarcated and delineated as hazardous are now literally dangerous to live in and increasingly climate vulnerable because this is a metric that is used to, to deserve it once response and natural disasters. Next slide. So given all of that information, given the very sorted and very real history of the ways in which data has been recognized, how do we Build political power in this moment. It can data mean as a tool? Can we transform it into a way, a channel of building the political power of that people? The answer is absolutely yes, as my story earlier showed, but also as I'm going to talk a bit about in the work of Data for Black Lives. This is not exhaustive of all the campaigns that we have going on, but I wanted to choose specific examples that really highlighted um, the, our, our different strategies and methods. And our methodology can really be uh, summed up in our slogan, reclaiming data as protest, data as accountability, and data as collective action. So this, so, this is uh, um, the front page of my testimony at the White House this summer um, at a meeting on data brokers. And this was a meeting, right now there's lots of closed door conversations that are happening within the federal government around how do we create guardrails? How do we better understand? How do we use AI? Of course, our stance is, let, before we even think about using AI, let's think about what are the solutions that people are already pushing for um, that can actually address these problems, right? And for us, instead of introducing maybe a new credit scoring model, how about we support the demand for reparations? But either way, so, it's very, it's been very, very important for us to engage in these spaces because oftentimes I'm the only person in the room that's even speaking on credit scoring. And I'm oftentimes the only person in the room who's even saying perhaps we should not use a automated decision making system or AI in this case. But going back to credit scores. So currently there is a $1.2 trillion wealth gap between white and black Americans. Between 2019 and 2023, white wealth outpaced black wealth by 30%. This is data according to the Federal Reserve Bank. When we're thinking about housing and the impact of credit scores, again, you cannot rent a house in any major metropolitan area without a credit score. Plus. Today, black people are currently twice as likely to be homeless than white Americans, and although Black people are 13% of the population. We are 
currently nearly 50% of unhoused people nationally. Correction, black children are twice as likely to be homeless. If we also look at whole ownership, again, there's a big debate that's happening right now. I feel like, is whole ownership the only vehicle to addressing the wealth path to wealth? It is not the only vehicle, but it's a vehicle that, that has been routinely, historically, and systematically denied black people in this country. Again, if we could think about Seneca Bell, it should sound. But this is the chart that I came from the Black Wealth Data Center, Uber, you know, where between 2018 and 2021, black and buyers, uh, and especially a black woman under the age of 34, which I'm 33, was interesting. Um, they would be or scored, we were given the highest medium interest rate out of any other demographic group. Higher than Latinx, higher than white, higher than Asian. And again, the explanation for this is credit scores. Thanks. How do we even understand the disparity, right? A 2022 uh, study by NerdWallet showed that black people were four times more likely to report credit scores under 620 than white people, even when we had similar income and debt levels. A score under 620 is considered high risk, making it incredibly difficult to find an affordable place to rent in what you see. And a score of 620 and above is minimum to qualify for an FHA government loan. So in terms of our work, again, while... You know, the first time I even uplifted this demand of abolish FICO and our overall campaign to abolish big data um, at the federal level was in 2017 before data science and AI was even a conversation. And one thing about us in terms of how we do data activism, we are very consistent in our demands over years. No matter what is happening, we are unwavering in that. The fact that over the pandemic, FICO made record profit while families were suffering, while people selling credit products in order to help people prepare their credit. And the fact that FICO is literally a private company and their number one product is their scores. Something needs to change. Again, we've been really pushing for a public credit registry, uh, which is a solution that emerged many years ago as well, that many, like virus Um, We've been working with groups like Underwriters for Racial Justice, um, to ensure that there is alternative ways for us to think about lending, uh, working with the groups of CFDIs, but most importantly, um, pushing for reparations. If anything shows us that this disparity is not going to be addressed by technological solutions alone, but by really bold and really urgent public policy. Next slide. And this is how going to go. The truth, which is that book have been gassed about financial period. Thank you. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, we were, we stepped up a lot in terms of supplying data, working with data, organizing uh, different cells of volunteers in, in different cities. And what we were seeing then and what we continue to see now is the overuse of AI in the health arena. And again, it requires long-term power building and long-term strategizing spaces like this, spaces like our conference. But it's been very, very, very important for us to ensure that not only are we providing new information, but we're also providing clear recommendations and clear steps for how people can use the data. But to even walk back a bit, in 2020, uh, researchers at the University of California, Berkeley, broke open a proprietary algorithm developed by the insurance site United Health. Um, and they found that this algorithm had been used to make decisions uh, about the healthcare of over 200 million patients, 200, yeah, millions of patients, because United has so many different um, patients. But Folks were wondering why was it that, according to this algorithm, black patients were being deprioritized for care. And when we think again about proxies, we know that zip code in one proxy, but in the health arena, what they found, at least in this algorithm, was that the cost of care was a proxy. The reason why 
this algorithm had deprioritized black patients, which led to people's death, was because while their medical issues were more uh, urgent, building a model that optimized for the cost of care and making that a proxy for need completely codified and reinforced deeply in great health disparities root, rooted in, in judgments about who is worthy of care and who isn't. When we think about it, who actually has health insurance to be able to pay for care, right? So who's going to be able to spend more on care? Next slide. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, there were so many groups fighting to be the first to publish findings, diagnose the crisis, and assert solutions. We were reading articles with headlines that exploited the disparate impact of COVID-19 on Black communities. We were bombarded by media and that justified the mass death of Black people and Latino people during the pandemic with narratives of cultural pathology, not the realities of structural racism. These were the very narratives that the families that I had organized with in Miami, especially, um, were, had, were fighting against. In April 2020, we convened a movement pulse check to explore why Black people across the U.S. were particularly vulnerable and overrepresented in COVID-19 cases and death, and to identify ways in which we could organize and mobilize in response. We urged the public and decision makers to understand that race is not a risk factor in its own, but racism is. Race is not biological, but a history of ideas, weaponized through grants public policy and systematic disinvestment. We also built this COVID-19 database where we uh, built a full of Python script that would automatically pull data from every single state's public health site because we really wanted to get a sense of what were the actual numbers, what were the incidents of cases, what were the numbers of deaths, Later on, we were, we collaborated with folks at the Atlantic, um, who ended up picking up this project and it turned it into a, a much more robust database. But again, for us, the goal was not data on its own. Next slide. The goal was to ensure that the data that you were producing would not, again, once again, not just be used for temporary reform, but would be used for longer. Fuck okay. And so we released with this code bank, uh, a list of demands, data integrity, no weaponization, immediate action, and structural change. We were able to bring these demands to chief data officers, public health officials all over the country. But most importantly, we were able to equip people on the ground, directly impacted communities with the data that they can use to approach um, the hospitals, to approach public services, to organize mutual aid, um, fundraisers and, and benefits, and to really, really respond on the ground. And this is a really good example for us of what it actually meant to put this data into the hands of people who really needed the loss. And again, while I'm talking about this, and again, we're in, we continue to be in the midst of, of the pandemic, it is certainly not over. It's important that we continue to meet in Jilland and to continue to push back Again, structure is that concentrating the power of data to the end of the opinion. Next slide. Very briefly, I know that all of the rave right now is large language, large language models such as ChatGPT, BARD, and Anthropix Claude. But this is a study that recently came out that showed the way in which these large language models being used in clinical settings are perpetuating the same uh, narratives and structures and systems that I've been talking about this entire time. The report found that all four models tested, ChatGPT, BARD, Thon, failed when asked to respond to the medical questions about kidney function, lung capacity, and skin thickness. In some cases, they appeared to reinforce these long-held false beliefs about the biological differences between black and white people. Such as that black patients have lower pain, um, and a litany of other extremely wrong responses. We go to the next slide to show though. So though this chart shows some of the questions that they asked, that I encourage everybody to really go look at this study. It was actually done by the amazing baller at Stanford, 
But after five total runs, and after asking these questions, it just really, really showed the ways in which, once again, what, what we know it, in the data space is that these large language models only are regurgitating ex existing information online, existing information in private databases. And then in order for us to actually be able to build tools that uh, truly can be used to address long health, health disparities, we need to change not only the models themselves, the input data, but who's actually involved in the development of these technologies. Next. Um, before I get to talk about no more data weapons, um, and I mentioned this as a mass slide, but um, one of the things, one of the camp. Yeah, Simon. Like this is the better time for it. Yeah, yeah. I this is a much better time to talk about those because. I think this is a point that is, that is really, really essential. It's the fact that we have to change the cast or character. We have to bring in different people who are involved in not just the development, but the development of even technology. Very quickly, this is one of the, um, this is an article from a campaign that we're called to support in St. Louis, Minneapolis. Um, some education justice organizers approached us and said that the Twin Cities, um, the sheriff, the mayor's office, the school board, the police agency, they had all announced the joint powers agreement to share data across different agencies for the creation of a risk ratio score. The organizers named this effort, but also their coalition, the Coalition to End the Cradle to Prison Algorithm. But not, so many people in this community did not even know what an algorithm was, what a risk ratio was, but they knew that in a city where, again, black students were a very small percentage of the population, but overrepresented in suspensions, arrests, uh, the foster care system, that these would all be, these risk ratios would only be used to justify further harm. So Data for Black Lives, we got involved. We went to St. Paul, Minnesota. We organized summits, we worked on strategy, we worked on research, and by supporting them, uh, taking the initiative and leading this in their own community, they were able to not only get the mayor's office and the school system to totally get rid of this plan to create these risk ratios, but they were also able to build an organization that has now really built the power that's been necessary to, to push back and to ensure that instead of implementing these harm from technologies, they're listening to the demands of the community for restorative justice, to increase the funding in their schools. And um, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I was going to go into an over and weapon campaign when I think I might stop there because and in terms of a campaign, I can briefly talk about it, but um, we define data weapons as any technological tool to surveil, police, criminalize black and brown communities. Uh, we launched a No More Data Weapons campaign in 2020 in response to um, the growing mm, worldwide uprisings, but also the fact that there was these demands to around police abolition, but also defunding the police. We knew that there had already been a trend, not just to defund, but to replace police officers with technology. So we launched this campaign then, and actually one of our first campaigns that was supported was one um, in Palestine, actually. We we wrote a statement of solidarity with the residents of Sheikh Jarrah, and we joined uh, forces with, with the No Tech for Apartheid campaign, because we knew that there was a lot of common and even some of these big tech companies. <laughs> but... You know, this is an ongoing thing that we're working on. We, the latest development in the campaign is that we, um, in 2020 and 2022, we, uh, sued the Metropolitan Police Department and the city of DC. Uh, we did a FOIA records request suit in order to demand that the police hand over documents that show the extent of social media monitoring. So, I said I wouldn't have what it would. They'll talk about it a little bit because, yeah. And what we found and what we, yeah, it's, it's 
shocking, right? This is a example of one of the emails that we were able to get from an FPD one that showed the extent of their surveillance of activist community leaders in DC. It's a tweet by Kamala Hassan with Jesse McGurk. And clearly, here, you know, like all of us, politically active in every community, giving folks since then and then update about whether or not in every Detroit, you know, the pros and this. The, the, the chief kind of wanted of me, but as you look up, this is not just a detail, but to be a policy to release in the cockpit. They're communicating with the, 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 the public insecurity, the national club of service, the secret service, how to release that. And then they would see them saying, and it's really with the reading he's out now, how and who I would put the protest, but I gave it to you, she puts a big sticker over the child and commit. This was the level and the granularity. So, as we're, we're right now in the process of analyzing all this data and writing a report, it is, though you'll be able to, to, to see more, but it's been really, really shocking, but important to focus on DC because from the very, t from the time local police detectives James Worley Jones worked with J. Edgar Weaver to spy on the United Negro Improvement Association and Marcus Garvey to the targeting of black activists locally as part of their national co intel program. The current high-tech social media monitoring of Black people and everybody else organizing protests following police orders today is stark. With this in mind, data for Black Lives and the Brennan Center requested an information about the practices of the Metropolitan Police Department and any federal partners. And through our efforts and the documents that we've been able to obtain, although it's an incomplete but growing picture, we found that the practices it deployed in monitoring people, particularly black youth and protesters, happen online. We, we, we found that protest, vigils, and even celebrations, all vital elements to any truly democratic society are held particularly under scrutiny. Next slide. This is, uh, one of the slides that we got that is what's part of a presentation by one of the companies. So according to our research as well, and the, the documents that we got back, it's what as of as of mental research, the FED spent over a million dollars contracting out the state of broker companies like Boyer. And you know, these are selling to people, they they, they sell it to not only they they talk about it is um uh, effectiveness and Figuring out his profiles, trying to get social dem work, trying to get people's location. But the part I really want to demand that anyway, look at this. Well, look at this literal picture of who they're including in this law, right? It's clear that this is targeted. Next slide. So as we're working on this research and then we're compiling the report with it really kindly because um, the city of DC is introducing an omnibus crime bill that totally supports social media monitoring. And this is an article that our organizer in DC actually then shows that not only are they, um, baking this into a hundred plus page crime bill, but they're also out here really saying, look, this is going to be the solution to violent crime and carjacking. From our research, we know that this data is not being used to address violent crime and carjackings, but actually to target people's political expression of their political power, joy, and communal settings. We have data that shows that they targeted go-go parties and meet mill concerts. We have an entire list that showed the Dirty for Justice Alliance being targeted, which we have to talk about. Yeah. And again, it, it, it doesn't, it, 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 it goes without saying, and it's kind of still dawning on me, the importance of us being here in the very place where Malcolm X was assassinated, especially as there's more information coming out about the CIA's role and the, and the NYPD's involvement in, um, in, um, his death, but also in the attempted destabilization of his organization. But this is really, this is really, 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 really why we, we do this work. We are using data to not just build political power, to extract and expose structures, but also to protect 
people's ability to express their constitutional right to protest and to even live in joy and to not have to live under surveillance than that. So I'll conclude there. There really is so much to talk about, and I wish I had more time. And thankfully, um, we will be announcing the dates for the next Data for Black Lives conference soon. And all of this information is available on our website, except for the report, which has not been published yet. Um, and I'll also, if folks are interested, share my slides and, and any resources from this talk. But, you know, I know a lot of this can seem very heavy and very depressing, but I want I also know that it's there, it's very sobering. And I think that we have to be able to understand the extent of the problem in order to be empowered around the solutions. And we have to know that even though it feels fatalistic and that there is also this narrative that is being pushed that we have no control over what's happening with the onset of data and weaponization of data, we have to know that we do have the power, even though we, we might be outspent, even though we might feel outnumbered, Right here in this room, we actually do have the power. It literally only takes, I think, 3% of the population to start a revolution. We don't actually need that many people, but what our goal is at Data for Black Lives to ensure that everyone who comes into our orbit understands this information, understands the history of resistance in our community, but most importantly also understands that this is a political home for them to be able to grow and to learn and to become movement scientists. Our work continues, taking data and putting it into the hands of people on the front lines, engaging with city and state officials, building the power of directly impacted people, doing workshops, doing trainings, convening. All of these activities are for the, po are for the purpose of building the political power necessary to ensure long-term structural change. And this is the final message I want to leave you all with. Any intervention that does actually not build the agency of people, especially the most vulnerable, is liable to harm rather than help. And any solution that is designed without the involvement of directly impacted people is no solution at all. Part of our work at D4BL is asking ourselves not just what do we need to do, but who do we need to be? Who do we need to be right now? as we engage in the most urgent civil rights battles of our generation. I pose a question to myself every single day as I'm in this role. And I also invite you to think about that, but also to see yourselves as part of what we're building and to please plug into our work. I look forward to talking more in the Q&A. Thank you.